Senator, nice to see you, sir. Thank you, Greta. Nice to see you. Well, it's a big day tomorrow. Um, I'm curious what you think that early voting and absentee voting, uh, what impact it will have on your strategy, on your uh, results tomorrow night. Well, and in Florida, every year that's gone by, early voting has been a bigger and bigger part of the electorate. As much as 55% of the votes are cast before Election Day. So we think that trend will continue. We'll see tomorrow what happens. But we feel really good about the early vote. We've worked it hard and obviously have a lot of strong supporters throughout the state that have already voted. So, look, I, I'm doing anything. I, the only thing I know how to do is work hard and keep pushing forward with our message and, and uh, see what it leads to. God's will will be done. But uh, we feel positive about it. We really do. Did the polls sort of drag you down? I mean, it's like sort of the elephant in the room. Right now, uh, Donald Trump is way up in the polls in Florida. I mean, does that somehow uh, weigh heavily on you or not? Not, not on me. First of all, polls this cycle have been crazy and way off, both in Michigan on the Democratic side, Virginia and other places on the Republican side. Those polls are not accurate. There's just, there's, there is not a 20-point gap here going on. Um, but they're irrelevant. I mean, the only poll that matters is the one they take tomorrow when they actually count those votes. And, and that's the one that I can do something about. And that's what we're working on every day. We have a, we've had a very busy 10 days here working as hard as you can imagine. And we feel good about what that's turning into tomorrow. If you have a close second, I know you want to win, and I know that uh, you're optimistic that you will win, but if it's a close second, um, let's say you're three points off the first place winner, what does that do to your campaign? Well, we don't get 99 delegates, which is what we're aiming for. Florida's winner take all. This is not proportional, so the winner takes 99 delegates. And uh, I honestly believe that the winner of Florida uh, tomorrow is going to have a real advantage moving forward to getting to the number of delegates you need to get the nomination. The ideal outcome in this race is to have a candidate that can get to 1237, 1,237 delegates that the party can coalesce around. The problem we have is that the person closest to that number now, Donald Trump, is not someone the party can coalesce around. So it's why you're in this very unusual situation that we now face. Well, I guess I was sort of being polite. I was sort of casually asking that question. I realize it's winner take all in Florida. But what I meant was, you know, are you going to drop out? Are you going to sort of, if you don't take first place, are you going to uh, you know, tie your horse to John Kasich's card or to Senator Ted Cruz? What's your plan? Yeah, well, our plan is to be in Utah on Wednesday and to continue to campaign hard. I've never said that my campaign is built on the outcome of any specific state, especially the way it's going now. But, um, you know, with the, with the way it's turning out and all these delegates being apportioned out. So we had a nice win in Washington, D.C. this weekend and, you know, picked up some more delegates. Uh, I believe in Wyoming. We'll anticipate picking up delegates tomorrow in multiple states. So our, our plan is to continue to move forward. But right now, to be honest with you, I'm focused 100 percent on doing what I can do over the next 24 hours to make sure that I get these 99 delegates in Florida. It would be a huge boost to our campaign, of course, moving forward. You said that uh, about coalescing behind Donald Trump. Do you think the party cannot coalesce behind Donald Trump if he's a nominee? I know we can't for a couple of reasons. One, he's not a conservative. If, if you took the positions Donald Trump has on policy and his name was John Smith or, or Ron Williams or whatever you want, uh, he'd be called a rhino. I mean, he would have no chance. It's, it's unbelievable to me that there are people out there who are lifelong conservative activists and others who somehow find his position on issues acceptable. The conservative movement has to be about principles, not about how angry or nasty you're willing to be. And he's just not a conservative. And there's no way he will coalesce the party behind him. We also have a front runner in the Republican Party that uses profanity, who's offended virtually every group imaginable, who incites, I believe, uh, followers of his at rallies to perhaps take violence. And you've seen that even from his own campaign staffers. There is no way in the world that Donald Trump will ever coalesce the Republican Party. And that means if he's our nominee, we lose in November. And that, to me, is an unacceptable outcome. Well, he's not the only one that's had some protesters. I mean, even you've had some protesters. There's a video from January 4th where you have a little shoving. It's not, of course, you don't have thousands in the street in Chicago. But, uh, I mean, I mean, that's part of the sort of the, the, the process. Uh, the, when people run for office, you get a few protesters. That's the First Amendment, uh, uh, rude as oh, it may absolutely. be. Oh, absolutely. It's not that... Yeah, Greta, it's not that you don't have protesters. What you've never seen me do is tell my crowd, why don't you go ahead and, and do something to them physical, and if you get charged with a crime, I'll pay your legal fees. What you've never seen me do is talk about how protesters in the good old days used to leave on stretchers. You've never seen me talk in that way. On the contrary, of course, everyone has a heckler or a protester. And by the way, I'm not excusing their behavior, especially what you saw in Chicago on Friday night. These are radical left-wing groups, often paid protesters, professional disruptors. And this is something you see from the left. So I'm not talking about Chicago. I'm talking about the general tone of the campaign and what it's doing to our country. Do we really want to live in a country where everybody hates each other? 
where we can't have a debate about political issues, even a passionate debate, because everyone literally hates each other. And that's where we're heading now in our discourse. And it's just, it is dangerous for the Republic to continue down this road. Leadership is not about saying whatever's on your mind. Leadership is about leading, about acknowledging people's fears and anxieties, but describing to them how we're going to make it better, not preying on those anxieties and fears and making them worse so that they'll vote for you out of fear. You mean that you are the leader, you're the president, you wake up today and it is what it is, the state of affairs in Syria, and you hear that uh, Vladimir Putin is pulling out what he calls his main part of his military from Syria. Uh, what do you make of that and what do you do or not do? Well, what I make of it is that their engagement over the last few months in targeting the non-ISIS rebels has allowed the Assad regime to make significant gains and retake territory. And they've probably reached the point now where they believe that given the gains they've made, the Assad regime can finish the job of retaking most of the country and perpetuating itself in power. I anticipate, that, of course, they're going to keep their naval base, but they're also going to probably leave repositioned some aerial assets as well, which is what Vladimir Putin always wanted, was an aerial air force presence in the region. So my sense is that uh, it'll probably be partially a cosmetic withdrawal of, of pre-positioned forces because Assad has now probably consolidated enough of his gains uh, to, uh, to kind of leave the status quo uh, for a significant period of time moving forward. So what happens to the civil war? Hundreds of thousands of people have been reported dead. I saw a number from uh, five, 5,000 to 14,000 uh, children uh, in the civil war killed. I mean, what happens to this, the sort of the civil war on the ground in, in Syria? Well, what the bottom line is, is the Assad regime has specifically targeted Sunnis, and uh, those Sunni communities are never going to return, and they're certainly never going to live under Assad again. I don't think Syria as a nation state will ever be the same again. I don't know how you have a country where Sunni and Shia will be able to live together again as long as Assad is in power. He hasn't just killed, he's gassed, he's used poison, he's used barrel bombs against civilian populations, triggering the fastest exodus of people since World War II. Um, irrespective of the civil war and its conduct, you've left behind the conditions for continuing strife now in the foreseeable future. And another radical, if it's not ISIS, it'll be the uh, Jabhat al-Nusra or some other radical Sunni group that will take advantage of these sentiments uh, to have a foothold in, in key parts of Syria for the foreseeable future. And that just means more instability in the Middle East. Senator, thank you and uh, good luck tomorrow, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Greta. And winner take all states tomorrow. And